Hello and uh, welcome to London and welcome to Guide London. Uh, thank you for joining us again here. Um, my name is Fiona. I'm a Blue Badge Tourist Guide in London and uh, one of the team here at Guide London bringing you broadcasts three times a week. Uh, it's, it's a little bit rainy today in London, a little bit grey and drizzly. So uh, I know that's what a lot of people uh, think London is, is always like. It's actually the first time in about two weeks that we haven't had glorious sunshine here in London. Um, but it doesn't matter to us anyway because we're mostly indoors. And that's why we are coming round your house. We are bringing you a little bit of London, a little bit of history and a little bit of fun three times a week. And uh, today, actually, we're going to be bringing you quite a lot of murders and executions. So uh, so brace yourselves, folks, uh, because today we are heading to the Tower of London. It's a, a thousand year old fortress built uh, in the late 10 hundreds, started the White Tower, the one in the middle there in the 10 hundreds, and originally built right on the edge of London to protect London from attack. Uh, but in the years since then, it has been used as a royal residence, a palace, as uh, home to the Royal Mint, where we used to make the coins, uh, the Royal Menagerie, the, uh, the Royal ha sort of Animal Collection, which eventually turned into London Zoo. And of course, nowadays, still home to the Yeoman Warders, the, uh, the Beef Eaters of the Tower of London and the Ravens. And exciting news, folks, from the Ravens. Uh, in the last couple of days, they've announced that we have three new baby chicks that have been born about two weeks ago. So they're two, three weeks old now, and uh, they are doing well at the Tower of London. And the Ravens is what keeps it all safe. And of course, one of the things they're protecting is the crown jewels still held in the Tower of London. So lots to, uh, to cover. And uh, what we're going to do today is uh, if you're going to the Tower of London, there are four very important Richards that you need to know about. Three of them were kings of England. The fourth is the lovely Richard Ing. Hello. Hi, Fiona. How Hello. are you? I'm very good. And you're Excellent. you're going to be uh, you're you're well. I'm very well indeed, and looking forward to talking about the murder and mayhem at the Tower. Splendid. And before you get going, I want to introduce as well our lovely friend and colleague, Vicky Bailey. Hello, Hi, Vicky. Hi, Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Very well, thank you. And, uh, and you're going to take us further up to date at the Tower, is that right? Yes, I'm going to be talking about the executions and prisoners in the Tower of London in the 16th century, and also the attempt to steal the crown jewels. So. OK, exciting stuff. So before we do that, I just want to remind you, folks, if you are watching this live, then you can put comments and questions and suggestions in the boxes, uh, the comments box. And we'd love to hear from you, particularly if you're watching from far flung places around the world. Let us know where you are. Um, and uh, if you're watching, it, if you're catching up later, then those comments do still get to us eventually as well. So do feel free to keep making comments and questions, even if you're catching up with this uh, much later on. Uh, but for the moment, Richard, over to you. Hello. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Fiona. So um, we're going to start talking. We're going to talk about three Richards. Uh, we're going to talk about three Richards today. Uh, not very imaginatively Richard the first, Richard the second, and you'll never guess the last one, Richard the third. And uh, they're all associated with little bits of the tower or particular structures within the tower. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to get a picture up of, um, of the, the main site of the Tower of London. Uh, and um, uh, as we wait for that to come up, let me just describe the fortress, palace and prison that becomes the most important, most important fortress really in the entire kingdom built towards the end of the reign of William the First, William the Conqueror. But we're not going to talk about William the Conqueror today. We're going to talk about, to start with, Richard the First. Richard the First, 1189 to 1199, better known as the Lionheart. So the Lionheart, famous for being on the throne for 10 years, but only really spending six to seven months uh, in his own kingdom. For the rest of the time, he's off fighting the Crusades, warmongering in the, in the, in the Holy Land, trying to get Jerusalem back uh, for the country. But while he's away, he uh, 
decides that he wants a new structure built at the Tower of London. Again, I'm hoping uh, you're going to be able to see a picture of this uh, coming up on the screens in a second. Um, and the, the structure that we're talking about is the Bell Tower. The Bell Tower. Now, the Bell Tower, as you walk into the Tower of London, if you come and visit, which I hope you will do, uh, here we go. We've got a nice picture of the tower now. And um, right do dominating the space in the middle, you'll see the White Tower. Hopefully, Fiona can point to that. Hopefully, you can see that. That's the square in plan shape right in the middle with those fancy turrets on the top. We'll come and talk about that in a bit. But we're going to start by talking at the Bell Tower, which, as I mentioned, is as you walk through the main entrance just there in the corner, the first structure you see is the Bell Tower. And it's a very odd shape. So what happens is that Richard is in the Holy Land. Here we go. We've got a closer up picture of it here. You can see on the top the little white cupola on the top that that contains the bell rung every evening at about half past five to tell everybody that's visiting time to go home. This is one of the original curfew bells. The curfew was rung every night uh, to tell people in London, get inside your house and put your fire out. Why? Because you live in a wooden house and you want your fire out. Uh, and uh, just as a, a little sideline, um, the word curfew comes from the Norman French, couvre-feu, cover your fire. OK, so Richard's in the Holy Land and he sees the evolution of castle building. A square in plan shape is not, not ideal for defensive purposes like the White Tower. Here's a, here's a shot of Richard the Lionheart. There he is outside the Houses of Parliament. That's where you'll find that statue. Uh, square plan, no good, really, because if you undermine at a corner uh, of a square structure, you undermine it. What you want to do is bring the walls down. And that's what will happen. If you undermine the corner, you'll bring two walls down. So Richard sees this and he sees that there is an evolution in castle building in the Holy Land. And you might be able to see now a picture of Crag de Chevalier, one of the magnificent cru crusader castles uh, in the Holy Land. And you can see that uh, where well, we haven't got the walls, the main tower structures are circular in plan. But before we get to that, we go through uh, an intermediate phase where the structure is uh, polygonal in shape, about eight sided. As you can see, the bottom part of the bell tower there is polygonal. So Richard has got a message to his masons. Boys, don't give me any of that square rubbish. I want a polygonal tower, please. And that's what they build. But then Richard gets to places like Crack to Chevalier and he sees that actually the circular shape is the most robust, the most uh, most secure uh, shape to build. And so he gets another message back to the stonemasons at the tower. And he says, boys, forget the polygonal shape. I need it round. And completely missing the point, they build the top third of the bell tower in a circular shape. So it's kind of comedy architecture, really. We've got this extraordinary structure, but it shows us the evolution of castle building in one structure. Very, very few buildings do it quite so starkly. And that's one of the reasons why I love this part of the tower. But that's enough. We've got to move on very, very quickly. We've got to move on to our second king. This is Richard II. Here he is in all his glory. This um, image uh, might be known to some of you. You'll find this in uh, Westminster Abbey at the West End of Westminster Abbey. This is the first picture that we have, the first contemporary picture we have of an English monarch. And this is Richard II on his coronation day. Uh, Richard comes to the throne early. He's a young boy, only 10 years old when he comes to the throne. But the time period that we're talking about is 1381, because this takes us back to the Tower. Richard is staying in the Tower of London and he is locked up in, I say locked up by choice. He is secure in the White Tower, along with a number of his special advisors, I suppose we'd call them today. Here's the White Tower. And uh, Richard is uh, staying in uh, the Royal Apartments, along with his Archbishop of Canterbury, a man known as Simon of Sudbury, uh, and uh, his treasurer, a man called Richard Hales. Now, they are all deeply unpopular throughout the world because they in instituted a tax, a poll tax that affects everybody in the country. And particularly people in the southeast, the peasants of the southeast of England, led by a man called Watt Tyler, decide they're not having it and they are going to revolt. The Peasants' Revolt, as we call it, and they march to London. And over a couple of days in June, they cause absolute havoc. 
They destroy the great Savoy Palace on the site of what is today Somerset House. They put that to, uh, to flames. That is completely razed to the ground. But their main target is the White Tower. They want the king and they want Sudbury and they want Hales. Well, the king has left. He's gone. He's actually gone to meet a delegation of the peasants to try and come to an agreement with them, leaving the tower probably not as well defended as it should be. And what we have is the peasants get into the outer uh, outer part of the tower very easily and they storm the White Tower. And we've got a little bit of a little bit of a um, romantic view of what happened. Well, romantic would be one word. In fact, what happens is we've got Simon of Sudbury uh, praying at the bottom corner there, wearing his red, uh, red bishop's garb. And he is uh, taken out along with Hales and others. And in fact, they're not executed within the tower. They're taken to Tower Hill. And there they have the dubious distinction of being among the first people to be executed on Tower Hill. Poor old Simon of Sudbury, head whipped off. His mitre is nailed to his head, very gruesome, and placed on a spike, placed on London Bridge. So there we go. We've got to move on very quickly. We're going to move on to the third Richard. Here he is, the famous picture we have of uh, Richard III, evil king. But actually, this is only, he's only tangentially part of this story. Shakespeare puts Richard III uh, in charge of... In the 1470s, is a little bit early with that. Richard doesn't really come to power till 1483, but that doesn't matter. We're going to talk about Richard and we're going to talk about his brother, who is king at the period under consideration, Edward IV. This is the period we call the Wars of the Roses. We've got this great interdynastic struggle between the two royal houses. On the one hand, the House of York, represented by the White Rose. On the other hand, the House of Lancaster represented by the Red Rose. And for a period of about 30 years, we have this dreadful period in English history, uh, shocking carnage on the battlefields of English, tens of thousands of men killed. But the man that comes out on top is Edward, Edward IV. Edward IV's brother is Richard of Gloucester, later Richard III. But there is another brother uh, who I'm hoping we'll get a shot of in a second. Here he is, fine looking fellow he is. This is George, Duke of Clarence. Now, He's a third brother. He's a Yorkist, except he doesn't stay a Yorkist. And uh, rather surprisingly, he switches side during the Wars of the Roses and moves to the Lancastrian side, mainly because he is married to the daughter or one of the daughters of the Earl of Warwick, a leading Lancastrian, later known as Warwick the Kingmaker. Clarence switches sides. Not a great plan, really. And of course, uh, what happens is that the uh, the wars move in the Yorkists' favour. Clarence realises, oh, I better change my mind here. And he goes back to the Yorkist cause. He goes back to his brother, tail between his legs, says, I'm really sorry about that. I made a mistake. Please let me back in. Well, he's regarded, of course, with some suspicion from here on in. And in fact, eventually he is arrested and thrown in the Bowyer Tower. He's put on trial, found guilty of high treason, of course. And the Bowyer Tower is where... George, Duke of Clarence, meets his very unusual end. Uh, Shakespeare tells us the story. We're not sure if it's entirely accurate, but it's a great story. In the Bowyer Tower, at the bottom of the tower, are stored wine, particular, particular brand of, my, of wine, the Malmsey wine. And it's in one of these barrels that George, Duke of Clarence, meets his end. He is drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. That, that is the story that we get. Uh, a bit of a waste of a barrel of pretty good wine. Pretty shocking end for Clarence. But there we go. Three quick stories about the early part of the Tower of London. And now I'm going to go over to my good uh, friend and colleague, Vicky, who's going to tell you all about the 16th century and more murder and mayhem. Over to you, Vicky. Thanks, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Vicky, as you can see for yourselves, and I've been guiding now for 15 years. My specialist subjects include literature, Egyptology and rural history, and to continue with the history of the Tower of London. One of enormous dramas, tragedies continuously, but probably the most famous and the murkiest period of history within the Tower of London is that of the 16th century. Now, there were several reasons for there being a particular, a particularly high amount of tension at that time. One is religious problems. 
the Catholic Church was being challenged by the newly founded Protestant religion and anyone who made the decision to follow the religion that was not the official one of the country they were in was in danger of being imprisoned and often executed quite horribly. And a lot of the prisoners of this time were lodged within the Tower of London. It split Christianity in half and caused chaos throughout Europe. But more specifically in this country, the king at the time of all of this, the start of the Protestant religion, was King Henry VIII. Now, Henry VIII remained officially Catholic all his life, but in spite of that, he still caused chaos because he split from the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church. The reason was that Henry VIII wanted to have an annulment from his marriage to his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and the Pope was simply not granting this. So Henry VIII created his own Church of England within this country. He made himself the head of it and he gave himself his own annulment, which I guess was one way of dealing with it. And anybody who opposed this act of Henry VIII was again on a one-way track to be executed. The most famous opponent was Sir Thomas More, who was up until that point a close friend of Henry VIII, but Sir Thomas More was adamant that this was the wrong thing to do and refused to acknowledge Henry VIII as head of this new Church of England. So he was imprisoned in the bell tower, which Richard was talking about, inside the Tower of London for over a year and finally beheaded just outside the tower in the year 1535. And as if all of that wasn't enough, there was also Henry VIII's marital strife. King for 38 years and famous for having six wives in that time. Now, his second wife on the left hand side there, Anne Boleyn, and his fifth wife on the right, Catherine Howard, were both executed within the Tower of London. Both of them accused of having affairs with other men. In Anne Boleyn's case, she was also accused of incest and witchcraft as well. Now, in Anne Boleyn's case, she was almost certainly innocent, and the real crime that she committed was the crime of not giving birth to a son to inherit the throne. In addition to that, Henry VIII also seemed to be getting tired of her. So he trumped up the charges against her, and she was executed within the walls of the tower on the 19th of May, 1536. She is actually the only person to be beheaded on that site with a sword rather than an axe, because swords are much easier, much lighter to handle, whereas axes were much heavier, much clumsier, and often did not do the job in one blow. If any of you have seen the TV drama Wolf Hall about Thomas Cromwell, based on the novel by Hilary Mantel, the scene appears in that very poignantly and effectively of Anne Boleyn's execution. Now, moving on to Catherine Howard. I've got to ask if you ever had the rotten luck to be married to a king who's already had one wife executed on charges of adultery, what would you personally not do if you were married to that king? And guess what Catherine Howard was accused of doing? She was also accused of having an affair with the gentleman of the court, Thomas Carl Pepper. She was arrested and imprisoned at Hampton Court Palace Henry VIII's palace just outside London and is still actually said to haunt that site. She was later transported by boat along the River Thames to the Tower of London and she was executed here in 1542 at the age of only it's believed about 18 years old. No one knows her exact age because dates of birth of woman were not always recorded back in those days but that is believed to be roughly her approximate age. Now what we have here is an old plaque on the old execution site within the Tower of London um, dedicated to everyone who was killed there. You'll see Queen Anne Boleyn, the top name, and the third name down there she is, Queen Catherine Howard. Go two names down below that and you'll see the name Lady Jane Grey, uncrowned queen of nine days. 
Now, Lady Jane Grey was one of the most tragic members of the Tudor royal family. She was Henry VIII's great niece. She had a claim to the throne, but there were quite a few people between her and the throne. Nevertheless, she had a highly ambitious, ambitious father-in-law, the Duke of Northumberland, who led a rebellion against the rightful queen, Mary I, and put his daughter-in-law, Lady Jane Grey, on the throne instead. She was only 15 years old at the time. Lady Jane Grey stayed queen for nine days, and at the end of that time, supporters of Mary I managed to get the upper hand. Lady Jane went from being a, a queen in the tower to a prisoner in the tower, and she was executed at the age of only 16 years old on the 12th of February, 1554. Legend has it that if you ever go to the Tower of London on that date, the 12th of February, the ghost of Lady Jane Grey, a misty white figure, can be seen drifting around the execution site. Now you're probably getting the impression at the moment that every single royal who was held prisoner in the, within the Tower of London was going to meet their end fairly soon. But I'm happy to say that there was an exception to that. And that is Princess Elizabeth, who was Henry VIII's younger daughter. Now, Princess Elizabeth was accused of being involved in a rebellion to dethrone her older half-sister, Mary I. And the result was she was brought to the Tower of London and imprisoned there. Now, for Elizabeth, this was her worst nightmare come true because her mother was Anne Boleyn. So she was imprisoned in the castle that her mother had been executed at. But luckily for Elizabeth, she was clever. She did have a certain element of luck. There was no direct evidence connecting her up to the rebellion. And so after two months, she was in the end released. And four years later, her, her elder half-sister Mary I died and Elizabeth became Queen Elizabeth I. So she's the one person who got it right by going from being a prisoner in the Tower of London to a monarch instead of doing it the other way around, which uh, rather broke the trend at the time. Now, the number of executions did drop down as the centuries went by. The monarchy started losing its power. But you may be surprised to know that there have actually been some executions at the Tower relatively recently in its history. During the First World War, 11 German spies were uh, um, shot dead at the Tower of London. And the very last execution to take place within the Tower was during the Second World War. Another German spy called Josef Jacobs, who was shot to death while seated in this chair. You can see the top of it is broken because of that back in 1941. As I said, he is the last person to have been executed within the tower. Now I have to say, if you go on my tours, you'll probably be convinced that executions and murders were the only things that ever happened in the Tower of London. But of course, it wasn't just that. The Tower of London, as Fiona said, is the location where the crown jewels used by the monarch for state occasions are kept. It's believed that their value is worth approximately £3.5 billion. Nobody is quite certain because of the sentimental and historical value as well. But amongst the crown jewels, we have the largest cut diamond in the world. And that is the first star of Africa that is within the handle of the scepter. If you actually look at this picture here, you can see just where the coronation crown, ah oh, yes, here we go. There is an image of the first star of Africa, just a um, an illustration of it. But that diamond weighs 530.2 carats. I've been assured by Tower of London staff that the 0.2 is absolutely vital. <laughs> and it was discovered as part of a much larger diamond in South Africa, back in 1905, you know, the original diamond weighed over 3,000 carats, but this particular one is the largest piece that they cut off it. And every time I lay eyes on it, honestly, my fingers actually start to tingle. It is stunningly beautiful. The other ones we have in there, 
you've got the crown of St Edward for the coronation and also the imperial state crown, which is used by the monarch throughout their reign for state occasions. Now, they're kept in the Tower of London for security and have been ever since the 17th century. But there was one attempt over all this time to steal them, which almost succeeded. This man, Thomas Blood, was an Irish adventurer. But Thomas Blood disguised himself as a parson, a vicar, and he became best friends with the man who was in charge of guarding the crown jewels at the tower, the keeper of the jewels, Talbot Edwards. Over a period of several months, Thomas Blood and Talbot Edwards became, as I said, close friends. And at the end of that period of time, Thomas Blood turned up at the tower where the jewels were kept with a couple of friends of his and said to Talbot Edwards, oh, can we go down and see the jewels? Talbot Edwards, of course, having shown Thomas Blood the jewels many times, said, yes, that's absolutely fine. And he let them all down there. And the moment they're all in the room where the jewels were kept, they attacked Talbot Edwards, beat him up, tied him up and seized three of the crown jewels. Thomas Blood smashed the crown of St Edward flat with a mallet to get it under his cloak. One of the other thieves cut off the top of the scepter, again to make it easier to get under his cloak, and the third thief put the orb, the giant circular global ball, down his breeches to hide it. I always thought that must have impeded his movement horrendously, but luckily, or unluckily, for him he was not put to the test. Just as they're about to make their getaway, Talbot Edward's son came back unexpectedly and caught them literally red-handed and they were arrested on the spot. Now imagine if they'd done this in the reign of Henry VIII. Their life expectancy span would have been probably a matter of days. But the king at the time was Charles II. He actually met Thomas Blood, had an interview with him and apparently thought the whole thing was very amusing and that Thomas Blood was very amusing and entertaining as well. Charles II always had a soft spot for a plausible rogue, so he let him off. There's still um, theories as to exactly why he did that today. The um, amusement factor is the main one, but there's another story completely unconfirmed that realising Thomas Blood's talents, he enlisted him as a spy. But the fact is we don't really know and speculation is probably much more interesting than the truth is anyway. So the Tower of London is a site packed full of stories of history and I honestly recommend it enormously as a fantastic place to go to when things come go back to normal again. I mean it's um, become distinctly less lethal over the years in um, the old days they're all the prisoners desperately trying to get out of the tower. In the present day Here's us now paying to go inside. So a lot, as I said, safer today. But as I said, once everything gets back to normal again, just come and see it because it is the most interesting, most fantastic site in London. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much, uh, Vicky. Um, and, and Richard, two fabulous talks there. And absolutely is a place that I know a lot of guides in London are really itching to get back to. So I have got a quick question for you both. Um, what, what's the place in the tower that you're most looking forward to showing people or taking people to or when we can? Uh, Richard. Thanks, Fiona. Well, I, su I suppose a lot of people would, would say straight away, uh, well, I've got to be the crown jewels and I do miss the crown jewels. But actually, the place that I like the most is the old medieval palace where some of the older kings... Uh, Edward I, for example, builds uh, the Thomas Tower and it's set out today in the way that it might have appeared when he was there. I like that. I like the Wakefield Tower where his dad, Henry III, constructed uh, another tower, uh, which is also the site of yet another murder. Henry VI, back to the Wars of the Roses, 1471. Henry is at prayer, having been captured and he is he is finished off in the Wakefield Tower. Uh, so tower tradition has it. So I'm looking forward to get getting back there. Splendid. And uh, we've just brought up that's your your website there. So if people do want to get in touch with Richard, Ing Tours is uh, is the place to go for that. Um, Vicky, 
people can find you at London Tour Guide Vicky. Is that that's correct? That's correct. Yeah. Lovely. And where would you like to go inside the tower? I'm afraid this is a terrible thing to say because I'm a very, very nice person, but I would probably go straight for the old execution site because it is such a lovely place today. It's got a very nice green lawn laid out. You're surrounded by all the historic buildings and this has got a real atmosphere around there. So um, that's where you'll see me on the first day the Tower of London opens up after the lockdown ends. Jolly good. And that, that just goes to show that we're all different because the place I would pick would be uh, right at the top of the stairs, just when you're heading into the White Tower. And before you go into the White Tower, if you turn and look out, you're looking across the ramparts over at London Bridge, Tower Bridge, and it's just such a fabulous view, but really makes it feel like the fortress that it was built as originally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So, and my website's still a bit of a work in progress. So for the moment, if you want to find me, uh, the best thing is probably on, on Instagram there. But uh, there is one other option. If you want to find um, any of us, if you have a look at the uh, Guide London website, um, which you can see here. So we're guidelondon.org.uk. And on there, you can find details of various of the popular tours that we do in London and uh, around other places nearby as well. Uh, we've got lots of, uh, lots of exciting blog posts coming up at the moment. And uh, right down the bottom, you can find uh, find a guide. And if you click on that down there, then you can look up the profiles of any of the guides that you see uh, to, you've seen today or doing doing these broadcasts generally. So uh, do do that. Having asked for all your comments, I've realized while I'm doing this, I've got stuff on the screen. I can't really see the comments very easily. But I did have enough to notice that we've got people from Liverpool, from Norway, from Fantastic. Jersey. Fantastic. So we are reaching out there. That's either Jersey in the in the channel or Jersey across the across the pond. I'm going to go across the pond, hopefully. Mm. Um, so do please do keep getting in touch, rather say, with your requests. Uh, there's about 600 of us Blue Badge Guides in London uh, working for Guide London. And uh, any topic you want to know about, it's highly likely one of us will know something about it. And if you, we don't, we love the research. So we will find out things and, and get back to you. So, so do keep giving us your comments and requests and things. And last thing before we go, a quick plug for uh, coming up on Friday. Friday is the 1st of May. So we are, of course, going to be talking about May Day uh, at four o'clock on Friday. And on Monday, we'll be talking about the Beatles in London. So that's either the Beatles, the band, or maybe the insects. Tune <laughs> in on Monday and find out because who knows it really could go either way. Um, so thank you all very much for joining us today. We hope to see you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your lovely day. Thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. bye.